Thank you very much for, uh, for uh, making this happen. So um, I had to kind of rearrange a lot after talking to lots of people. Um, so what I was originally going to talk about is actually something we will never be able to get to probably today. Let's see, maybe. But I put a lot of arithmetic in the middle. Um, so the title is now Statistical Regular Pavings for Non-Parametric Density Estimation, Emphasizing Tree Arithmetic. So I'm Rajesh Sainuddin, and uh, my URL is lamastex.org. And this is joint work with my first PhD student, Gloria Teng, um, and my uh, uh, first master's student, Jennifer Harlow, and Warwick Decker, who was doing postdoc at Cornell when I was a grad student. So here are some real world motivations. Right, so we sort of are motivated by our traffic code trajectories. I'm motivated by them. I was motivated by them uh, in 20, 2011, 2010. So we sort of came across a really nice data set from NASA uh, with concomitant weather data uh, over Atlanta, Georgia, one of the busiest airports. And that was joint work with uh, uh, Kuhn, KUHN. He's an uh, air traffic engineer by training uh, and RAND Corporation a couple years ago. The second real world motivation is very ancient. It's philosophical. I'm particularly interested in epistemology under a given tradition of logic and um, making a livelihood. So this is, I'm calling this a Hume phenomenon. Okay. And this is phenomenon is an, an inquiry concerning human understanding in 1777. So this is uh, the European empiricism. Non-parametric density estimation is the main topic. And, uh, and then we're going to get into arithmetic and algebra of plain binary trees. So this is only supposed to take 23 minutes if I do it right. This is something in our primer series, at the Center for uh, Computable and Constructive Mathematics in Christchurch, New Zealand. And then we all rush to have a pint of beer after that 20 minutes. <laughs> so um, I may not be able to get here, but it's there because there's a lot of connections to, uh, for example, Lombert's all minimal stuff I was looking in Wikipedia. The chapter, there's a whole chapter on Bopnik Chervaninkis theory. And uh, it's all about, uh, from a non parametric empirical process point, viewpoint, it's all about understanding the growth of the complexity, a particular measure of a combinatorial geometric complexity of what you can observe. Okay, these are events. And that's kind of a, 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 a parallel problem with parametric models, and they're kind of equally important. Okay, so the solution for that, that of the so-called L1 school is called minimum distance estimation with so-called oracle bounds. I'll explain a little bit what that is at a very high level, but the details are here. There was no implementation available for this uh, until now. I mean, if I manage to submit it, okay. Uh, so some conclusions and references. And this work uh, is mainly motivated by Luke DeVroy uh, in, in McGill, who wrote this book called The Probabilistic Theory of Pattern Recognition. So real world motivations. So this is about 12 gigabytes compressed data for 59 days of weather and air traffic over Atlanta, Georgia. So the actual sensors are measuring every half an hour. And there are predictions made with some uh, models from um, weather people every five minutes. And uh, these are the sort of two main things um, I think it's like cloud height and precipitation. So there are 45 times 59, 2,655 2, half an hour blocks of me actually measured weather data. Ah, I was supposed to uh, uncommon. This is a huge PNG image. I'll try to put it in the slides that'll hang, <laughs> that'll be in the uh, live. So what you can imagine is a huge classification tree of different kinds of weather patterns that you can just extract out using standard machine learning, okay? So there'll be some days where the winds will be blowing in a certain direction with certain cloud covers and at other days in a different way. So there are actually uh, similar types of weather half hour blocks. That's very, very important because when the weather is very different, the collective intelligence of all the pilots that are co-landing with their co-trajectories will, will start doing something that's very specific to Atlanta, Georgia, right? Which means the air traffic controllers who are usually given, or at least three, four years ago, different quadrants of physical space, right? Bob gets this, Susie gets this, whatever, to manage the air traffic in that zone. 
uh, can get pounded when the weather changes because one will be doing a lot of load, right? Uh, I have a second cousin doing air traffic control in Chicago, and this is dedicated to all my nth cousins in air traffic, okay? And that's a very important motivation. They have one of the highest suicide rates of any profession. Um, dynamic ZMRP, so Z is integers. I'll tell you what MRPs are. That's the whole arithmetic part. What we also want to do is be very precise about what data is coming from the radar, right? So we, this is actually what happens. Every four to, second, four to six seconds, you have a sweep. And then you have the position data of a particular flight ID. And so you know, there are these jumps. They're not jumps. Of course, the plane is flying continuously. But that's what you're seeing. We want to enclose that to account for the flight ID specific sizes of the planes and their fuel capacities and things like that. Okay? So and we want to may also put some, some safe, uh, safety zones around it, navigable safety zones. So these are these boxes. This we leave to the engineers to figure out what those are. So this is kind of how it's going to look. The plane is somewhere there, there, and so on. And this will be a tree that corresponds to, to being able to do arithmetic with one trajectory. There will be another tree for another flight ID, and so on. So we want to just somehow superimpose them so we get code trajectories. And it's z because z is just uh, integer um, counting. Right? And it's negative numbers are allowed because the motivation is we can do arithmetic on the code trajectories directly to do some, some kind of machine learning to help uh, ease the management. So that could be some kind of dynamic, uh, um, you know, dynamic airspace configuration. What but. Does the tree have to do with the oh, the tree is just a representation of uh, which cell is occupied. I, I, you have to wait a little bit because I have to go. I, I'll, I'll definitely tell you how the tree encodes the the occupied boxes. <coughs> so this is actually uh, three individual tra trajectories of some really amazing uh, birds uh, from the Department of Conservation that are flying very far um, into the South Pacific to fish. They eat specific kinds of fish. Their life, their babies are all completely dependent on the particular schools of fish that are traveling at different times of the year, which are being mined as well. So you know, if you want to really understand and get a signature of overfishing, possibly, these are like canneries in a, in a, in a sort of fish-eating mine. OK, so that's very important as well. OK, so now on a sunny day over Atlanta, Georgia, flights are landing sweetly. There are four runways. This is just our plot, OK, to visualize. So when, when you do the ZMRP arithmetic, it's hard to see now. But we are enclosing all those trajectories simultaneously. OK, I'll explain this later. On a stormy day, in a certain type of stormy day, you zoom in, you know, flights are circling, waiting. So we want to capture the arithmetic of these things in a safe way. OK, so again, this is a ZMRP on the sunny day. And we want to do subtraction, for example. So this is ZMRP of a sunny day minus a, rain, a stormy day. So you can see the blues, and okay, but this is only of interest uh, for uh, machine learning. <coughs> okay, but it's not just machine learning. So this is uh, so we construct these things called ZMRP dynamic trees. That means as the planes are actually landing and taking off, these these code trajectories will disappear and appear as the things are coming in, and so it, it's actually an active object. And we have physical thresholds. We could push it to ten seconds. The radar is sweeping every six seconds. So we, our structures need to be dynamically balanced, balanced or representable in the machine. So these are actually uh, time it takes. As the radar bursts increase, um, this is what you can do. Okay, this is just the latitude, longitude, and altitude. Uh, the data is not too, you know, it's not a big deal because the altitude is heavily conf confidentialized probably by the FB FAA. So, all right, <coughs> the phenomena. Uh, damp double pendulum, so you saw something very nice about the single pendulum concretely in Julia earlier, from Luis. So we actually built a mechatronically measurable double pendulum with full specifications. Uh, so this is the physical device. This is the hands of Pierre Lorenz. He's one of the honor students. Um, so he's just releasing it. There's two arms. He's releasing it from a particular position. It's dissipative, so there's gravity and friction, and it swings. So these are two trajectories. 
released almost from the same initial condition. And you can see that there is enough energy in the system at the initial condition for the trajectories to diverge. So this, this, is, the, you know, this is enough for us to, we don't need you know, constant energy and we're not interested in control problems. I mean, we just want to do some simple stuff. So there's a parametric model for it. Uh, you can look it up in Wikipedia. So it's the center of mass of each arm in these idealized rods and you know, uh, height of each arm. And uh, um, this is what you're measuring, theta 1 and theta 2. Lengths, there's gravity. And <coughs> so this is, you know, I don't know, so this uh, standard uh, Euler Lagrangian derivation. I won't go into it, but it involves the standard functions. Uh, and you get something, uh, vector field. <laughs> okay, but it's parametric, it's finite dimensional. And uh, you know, physicists uh, know what to do with this. But we have uh, this many parameters here, uh, ten, 10 parameters, including gravity. <coughs> so what's the, so the difference between finite versus infinite dimensional models from a, a decision theoretic point of view? So finite dimensional models can be rigorously exhausted in reality, right? So we specifically constructed this double pendulum so that we can actually put like bobs with double hooks with springs, okay, into each arm. We can put permanent magnets at desired locations. We can add extra masses where we like. And uh, so that means we can challenge any human who wants to come up with a finite dimensional explanation of the phenomena, right? We can, we can put vice grips to lock the top arm, you know, to <laughs> stable stance, but you can play with that too. So, so we want to uh, be very, uh, we want to challenge any finite dimensional formulation, okay? Uh, when I put on my non-parametric hat, okay? But of course, we're working here very hard. It's not easy. So to rigorously exhaust the parametric models, we need to actually do computated proofs in dynamics. There's a Polish library, CAPD, we're using. Um, we also use CXSC, so we use all the classical libraries. Um, but we're sort of pointer types, so C, C++, okay? Um, yeah, so that's um, work in progress. And then here, today's talk or the planned talk, we're taking a non-parametric empirical process approach, okay? Which means essentially we, uh, we allow the models to be infinite dimensional, so there's no finite uh, parameter sp uh, the specification. But we want this, uh, this inference to be uh, to hold this property called universal performance guarantees. This is the property of the so-called L1 school, which is very difficult to come up with an algorithm to do it. And um, you want to basically estimate the density of the trajectories from multiple independent releases of each arm, okay? So you, anyone, you can do as much data as you like. So that's our assumption. And we are also making the assumption that when I release it from pretty similar up to the, up to the nonlinearity and the chaos in the, in the process, it's an it's a independent identical release, okay? That means there's no pixie doing anything. Okay, so this is actually um, Constru Math South 2012. So it's supported by Constru Math, as well as CoreCon, all of this work. So these are some people, and these are the double pendulum trajectory release signatures after the event, okay? So, so we're using data from here uh, for inference. So uh, the part, that I may not be able to go into produces outputs like this. This is a strongly, uh, uh, you know, this universally consistent uh, uh, non-parametric density estimate of arm one and arm two with these performance guarantees. I'll explain what they are. Okay. Um, I guess I should qualify very quickly by saying that the 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 interval stuff, even if you could do it correctly. And if you control as much as possible, the, the, the slits in the optical encoders have manufacturing errors, right? So you really probably, maybe, possibly need the, the angular positions to actually be locked intervals, overlapping intervals. I don't know. We're also ignoring the time algebra up to quartz, quartz drifts. We're, we're measuring up to uh, you know, one millionth of a second. But, but, but the time algebra, we, we're doing everything partitioned, right? Set partitions, fine partitions, but they may not be fine. So we're ignoring all those details, and it may not matter for the system. So 
oh, we have to have a beer and go dancing in New Delhi or something for that. Right? Let's go, okay. So massive metric data streams, right? What is this? A massive metric data stream is simply this. It's just coming at you. And these are just points in RD. And they are independent and identically distributed from some unknown density f. Okay? And what I mean by a burst is this bold stuff. I'm looking at bursts at a time. Okay? Because I have finite random access memory on my machine. <coughs> so this is kind of our limits. Uh, basically, dimension is less than 10 and usually around 6 for uh, highly structured densities. That means there's very complicated densities. Okay, if they're not highly structured, you can push it far. The sample size for a single burst is somewhere between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 10, depending on the, how complex F is in L1. So most estimators have grind to a halt on such data sets, I mean, available implementations. <coughs> So we need a multi-dimensional metric data structure that is capable of computational efficiency. So we, you know, concretely, we have to do before the next radar sweep. Okay. Statistically consistent, that means the integral of the absolute value of fn minus f integrated of the Lebesgue measure goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And I want to emphasize Stelgy. We're kind of going down the, the Lebesgue road here, right? So the Lebesgue road basically is, um, you know, I can do f, some density f, and I can multiply it by some Lebesgue measure. So this is called the lebesgue stelgi measure, but the Stelgy measure of Lebesgue is just one instance of the Stelgy measure, which is the product x times y. Okay? So that means we can not worry about phenomena like this Okay, that means points are just fall, falling on a lower, dim, lower one dimension, you know, lower dimensional Lebesgue dominated objects. Why are these things important? Not for today's talk. Why are these things important? This is essentially the kernel behind support vector machines, deep learning, things like that. Right? They have to cut and, and take. So just, just again a qualification of what this doesn't cover. So we want the structures to be data adaptive. The, and non-parametric, which means it has to learn from the data with the minimal assumption. And we want universal performance guarantees, right? What does this mean? So this means not only should Fn, the estimate, approach F, you know, in L1, as n goes to infinity, but the rate at which n goes to infinity, and not just the rate at which n goes to infinity, the rate at which each one of the xi's up to n in that burst go to infinity, possibly, right? So that's data adaptivity. So if you want to get strong error bounds for this, and that's, uh, so the main point of the talk was go there. For that, we need to account for a combinatorial geometric complexity of the observed events, right? How are you encoding what you think you see? Right? That's very important. So here's a toy example. So let's take x1 through xn. Uh, independent and identically distributed samples. They're shown through these blue dots. And they're coming from some unknown density f. Okay? So my PhD dissertation was actually to rigorously produce these points by using interval analysis, using the old method that gave the detonator for the US by von Neumann, starting from the middle square method, the number theoretic pseudo-random streams. So we use that, or I use that to actually check my own intuitions. Uh, that's very normal in simulation. So you simulated that, and you, you're guaranteed that these are correct. OK, I'm not using cock. But you know, because you get interval bounds using the range uh, you were talking about. And then you, because you have these upper bounds, you know that the underlying density is in there. So all you have at your disposal is to uniformly spread mass inside each of these cuboids that contain the density. And then you have to throw away the ones that are, that are between the density and the enclosure of it. That's called the rejection method, right? That's the fundamental theorem of simulation, basically. So now the problem is we want to go from the blue dots back to that. So this is basically a histogram. All I'm saying is we want to make histograms. Okay? But we want to make them such that Fn, the estimate, which formally is just a map from R to the D to the N for the N data points, cross R to the D to R. 
So that's what we're hunting, Fn. But we want this Fn such that it's imbued with some kind of arithmetic of interest for the operation at hand. So <clears throat> this also should have universal performance guarantees. That means F is allowed to be in L1 even when you do the so-called smoothing problem, which is what's ignored in uh, more, all, every implementation I'm aware of of density estimation. So what's the smoothing problem? Smoothing problem is, you know, very simple, right? Bart Simpson will understand it. So I mean, you basically have a bunch of points, you make blocks, you count how many fell into that block, and you make the histogram. The question is, should you, should you chop a lot? There's a lot of chopping in the middle, so you get the spikiness, or not chop so much? This is called under-smoothing and over-smoothing. And everything basically is there. How, should, how much should I chop, and where should I concentrate my efforts chopping? Right? And more fundamentally, n is always less than infinity. So for n, however large, have we gone deep enough for that n over there, where those six size fell? Uh, or not. I mean, that's, that's the problem. Uh, and well, throughout the smoothing, we are still going to keep with our original promise that f is where it's supposed to live in L1. Okay. The, 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 all the other smoothing rules will say, uh, well, let's suppose f is really in L2 for the smoothing problem. OK, <clears throat> so this part is the arithmetic and algebra of planar binary trees. How is everyone doing? Okay. Good. How much time have I left? Oh, OK. Let's see if we can have the primers all. All right. Um, so this is the outline of this, this part. So we have uh, a theory of regular pavings. It's exactly the regular pavings. Uh, Luis talked about, except those regular pavings are a, a subclass of these. They usually have Boolean values mapped to them or uh, interval Booleans with this undecidability thing. Uh, but now we're mapping uh, reals, uh, other things now. So that's the theory, and we'll focus a little bit on real mapped regular pavings to get more intuition and uh, some applications. And these histogram things I'm talking about I'm formalizing them as Markov chains on the Hesse diagram of these trees giving birth to other trees by only splitting one leaf at a time. I'll, I'll explain in a picture soon. <clears throat> so this is extending arithmetic. So arithmetic over reals. There is uh, a natural extension of that to arithmetic over intervals, as you know now. Or and then our main idea is to further naturally extend to arithmetic over mapped partitions of an interval called mapped regular pavings. We want to do this by exploiting the algebraic structure of partitions formed by finite rooted binary trees, FRB trees. And thereby provide algorithms for several algebras and their inclusions in the Neumeier sense, oh. Arnold Neumeier sense. Uh, that he mentioned in the history of interval. So thereby we provide algorithms for several algebras over these partitions. Well, here's a color arithmetic, right? So you've got some partition of the space, and the trees will encode this partition. I'll explain how. And you have a, one mapping. So you map red to this box, whatever to each box, another bunch of colors. And then you do some, there's some notion of subtraction of RGB colors, native in C++. We want to get that subtraction. This is uh, closer to Jolin's world, except uh, here there is just uh, true or false. So this is a way to represent whether uh, the sphere, I mean, a subset of some big, big space. So I have a 2 minus 2 to 2 uh, cube. And then I'm encoding a subset of that using by mapping Boolean values to the tree. Here are two spheres, and then the intersection. OK, but these spheres are holes in them. So. And of course, for non-parametric density estimation, this is the motivation. We want to say average histograms. But the point is we want to average histograms with different partitions. In the Neumeier's inclusion algebra, right, he has the same fine grid 
in the same old sense of the dyadic partitions, right? The Hans set functions, for example. So where we want these partitions to be wide somewhere, not so wide somewhere, and then when we add the two, we want to be fast. Why do we want some, so it to be wide somewhere and not elsewhere? Because, because, you know, that's natural. I mean, because we don't want to split a lot and waste our effort when the function is badly changing somewhere. <coughs> okay. So MRPs allow any arithmetic defined over elements in Y to be extended pointwise to what I'm calling Y MRPs, or Y is just a, a, a plug-in. It can be Booleans, reals, interval reals, interval Booleans, etc. So essentially, we're doing arithmetic on piecewise constant functions and interval valued functions as a, the simplest example. Um, we're exploiting the tree-based structure to obtain interval enclosures of real valued functions efficiently. Um, and then uh, <coughs> statistical set processing operations like marginal density, <coughs> conditional density, and highest, highest coverage regions, and visualization. So this is the other important thing. We want, <coughs> we want the arithmetic to be of use to further statistical set processing. That means maybe I'm interested in the highest density regions. So people call this bump hunting. Okay? I want to be able to integrate out using the same tree, tree arithmetic. I want to define integrals by integrating out one coordinate. That's called marginalization. Right? Um, and I want to be able to slice. So I have some representation. I want to take a slice, okay? always, always parallel to the coordinates. Those are important for prediction because those are called conditional density regressions where we don't have to restrict ourselves to the expectation on that direction, but the full complexity of the, the, you know, what should be predicted. Right? That's hard to do because, uh, yeah. So other possibilities uh, to Jolin's world in Brest is we now have a tree arithmetic so we can do tree contractor programs further extending the basic results in applied interval analysis. So we implemented the first four chapters of applied interval analysis in this schema where we only map to interval booleans, like image SP or um, set inversion via interval propagation, all those standard algorithms. Okay, but we haven't done contractor programs and stuff, but our implementation is templatized. So somebody who really wants to can do quite, quite a bit more upstairs. <coughs> Okay, so <clears throat> the regularly paid boxes of X row can be represented by nodes of the finite rooted binary tree of geometric group theory or planar rooted binary tree of enumerative combinatorics, which just goes by multiple names. So what we have X sub row, this is a bold X is an interval for me. So this is the root node, so the row. Here X sub row is just an interval in one dimension. And um, I split it. So I have x row L, x row R. And then I split again, x row LL, x row LR. Okay? So, but what if it's in 2D? We don't want to leave the space, right? Um, so, so in 2D, instead of choosing to split either way, which is necessary or uh, useful for certain statistical algorithms, here we don't do that. We always split along the first widest side. Okay, that's a canonical split. So because this is a square, and this is, I call this the first side, this the second side, this becomes the first widest side, so I split here. And then here, for this split, this is the first widest side, so I split there. So this is the encoding, right? So I never leave that space. I still stay in the same space of trees. But I, can, I just have to go deeper for higher dimensions. Yeah, I think there's some kind of piano curve trick, but. Okay, so we also have this thing to check our program. So uh, this is a leaf depth encoding. So you can get it as a string of integers. So this leaf is a depth three, depth three, depth two, depth one. Okay, this is a bijection, this or that tree. And we use either one. Most of the time we are staying in trees because of pointers. Okay, so now you ask, how, so, so this tree with no split, just the root node, uh, is zero in the leap depth encoding. The first split is one, one, and so on. And then I, I do my immediate precedence by saying, I, I put an arrow, immediate precedence, if I can get from here to here by splitting only one node. Okay, so that gives me all these arrows for the Hess diagram. 
And then I ask how many trees are at each level. This is well-known result. This is Catalan numbers. Okay. And for uh, some of the justifications for our randomized algorithms, because see, we're actually running Markov chains here. And these Markov chains are driven by the data flowing in here. And the data trickles, and it decides where we should split next. So for that, we, so we sometimes need how many paths are there to come to each place. I mean, but that we have explicit results. It's, it's actually result found in other places by other names. OK, so now we call this uh, S for uh, uh, regular pavings. And this is from level 0 to level 3. This is S03. And you can do a split operation or a reunion operation and move in either direction. And the number of ways of getting to this tree is 2, number of paths. So the Catalan coefficient of this tree is 2, just like the binomial coefficient. <coughs> so now, uh, this is just the transition diagrams to show the complexity when you go to 4. This is basically our state space for our Markov chain. And um, we basically have to do something to decide where we should expend our effort to split next. Okay, so let's sort of set aside Markov chain for now and just focus on the most primitive operation. If some, someone wants to extract computational content, it's probably this one. It's the sort of the mother or father of all the other ones. And uh, it's the same one that allows uh, groups to be defined called Thompson's group. But I'm not using any group properties. So S super 1, S super 2 are the two pavings with root node row 1 and row 2. They represent this partition. I simply overlay the two transparencies, and I get this union. This union is different from Jolin's union and Voltaire. Their union is, uh, we, we call this a non-minimal union, and we call theirs a minimal union, because they're only interested in sets. We actually need to, it's a little more subtle, because we need to have half open spaces to define a pure partition. So the pairwise intersection of any of the cells is empty, and the union is everything. Otherwise, we can't do empirical processes. <coughs> Um, I guess I'll somebody's water. I think I need to drink a little water. <laughs> so this is just a lemma straight out of this book, uh, Thompson's uh, group. Okay, so it's just that the two things are closed under union operations. I'm not interested in proving this formally, or it'd be nice to do this formally, but you know, you just overlay them, and then you get another tree that's in the same space. OK, so what's the algorithm? This is the algorithm. It's uh, the pseudocode for it, right? So if perhaps someone could reverse engineer and get the you know, uh, realizability or whatever Hannes was saying, and which it might be interesting. But, but all I have to check is, um, is row 1 a leaf and row 2 a leaf? Then I just copy row 1 uh, and return it. Uh, uh, if the other, it's the other way around. Then I have to copy the other one and return it. I, you know, um, I can copy either, actually. And then else, I have to check if this is a leaf and this is not a leaf. Then I have to copy that way. And if neither of them are leaf, I jump. And then uh, this is a recursive uh, definition, the union. Unfortunately, the animation showing this in action won't work because I had trouble getting Adobe Acrobat and Ocular to talk in 16.10 Ubuntu. So definition, mapped regular paving. Let S be uh, in the space of uh, the full tree space, OK? Uh, limits to infinity. Let S be a regular paving with root node row and root box x row in IRD. Let Y be a non-empty set. <coughs> Let VFS and LFS denote the sets of all the nodes and just the leaf nodes of S, respectively. Let F go from VFS to Y uh, be the following. Um, it, takes a root, uh, it takes a node, maps it to some value F sub rho V, where rho V is an element uh, of, of any node, and F rho V is just an element of Y. That's just the map. Such a map, F, is called a Y-mapped regular paving. YMRP. Thus, a YMRPF is obtained by augmenting 
each node rho v of the tree S with an additional data member f rho v. There's nothing going on. Now, if y is r, we get this over 0, 0,8, where x rho is 0, 0,8. If y is b, we get Boolean map regular pavings. And if it's interval Boolean, we get the ones that are useful for robotics. And if y is ir, we get uh, the FRB tree representation for interval inclusion algebras of Neumeyer. So this is uh, basically the Rosenbach function kind of looks like a bat in this domain, so I caught it. And then there are these boxes that contain it in the standard way. And this is just uh, RGB colors. And aircraft trajectory. Okay, so now uh, uh, the, the primitives here are actually Z plus 0, 1, 2. I mean, that means there cannot be a, a no plane. There's no minus 1 <laughs> in the encoding of the data tree, right? Uh, but we just need Z because we want to add, subtract, and stuff uh, for machine learning. But, you know, so this is, is this clear now? I mean, you know, I'm just, well, you know, I'm splitting a lot, so the tree is just bigger. But, but I basically put zero where there's no plane of that ID in this root node whose flight ID is that flight. That's all that's going on. And then I only show the ones where, uh, show the boxes that are zero, you know, where it's unoccupied and the rock, but I'm not also putting where the zero is and where the one is, but that's what's going on. Okay, so now, why am I arithmetic? If star is an operator, which is nothing but uh, a map from y cross y to y, then we can extend star pointwise to two YMRPs, f and g, with root nodes row one and row two via the MRP operate. It just is a slight twist of the union. So, uh, so this is how it's done. You have f, g, this is f plus g. I'm not averaging, I'm not dividing by two yet. This animation won't work, but it's supposed to show how you start with this and you call MRP operate. This guy will co-descend on that guy and get the sum. Okay, so here is MRP operate, the full algorithm. If you notice, it's got the same calls, same checks, if, else if. Uh, it, you know, you're just tracking more, but we're using C++, so it's just kind of to define copy. <coughs> Unary transformations are easy. So MRP transform takes a root node and a transformation tau that goes from, say, R to R to give the RMRP F with root node row as follows. Copy F to G, recursively set every F row V to tau of F row V for each node row V in G, return G as tau of F. So suddenly we can just take sine of the RMRP or whatever, cosine, whatever you want. So now, there is a minimal representation of the RMRP, just like there is a minimal representation of the equivalence class of rationals. So this is F, G, F plus G, and then I'm calling this kind of lambda as my minimal representative. So what I do here basically is if, see this is actually a cherry node. A cherry node is a subterminal node with just two children. So I just pop the cherry because these are equal heights. So I don't need a split where the, the values are exact. So, but then here I cannot, because see here, <coughs> although these are the exact same real value, I need to make sure that this is kept because they're not cherry nodes. They're just, you know, different. Um, arithmetic and algebra of RMRPs. So thus we can obtain arithmetical expressions specified by finitely many sub-expressions in a directed acyclic graph of expressions whose nodes themselves are RMRPs. That means, you know, instead of pop having integer plus, we can just pop in RMRPs and define plus. So the nodes of the DAG will be RMRPs trickling. Do you understand what I mean? <coughs> so input and output nodes are themselves RMRPs and whose edges involve uh, these things. The edges of this graph is arithmetic operations <coughs> and uh, stand standard transformations and their compositions. So of course, you know, if you use contractor programs, like you mentioned, we can get efficient enclosures as well. So that's all upstairs you can handle through, through templates. We're not implementing that. So this is the theorem, FB the class of RMRPs with the same root box X row, 
Then f is dense in the space of the algebra of real valued continuous functions on x row. That's just a direct application of uh, uh, stone weierstrass theorem. Right? So since x row is in IRD, uh, it's a compact Hausdorff space. By the stone weierstrass theorem, we can establish that f is dense in C x row r with the topology of uniform convergence, provided that f is a subalgebra of C x row r that separates points in x row and which contains a non-zero constant function. Uh, these are satisfied by construction. So f is a subalgebra of C x row r since it's closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Right? <coughs> so f contains non-zero constant functions. Finally, RPs can clearly separate distinct points x and x prime that are not the same uh, because we can just chop deeply enough and we are partitioning unlike Jolin does. So uh, thus, the class of RMRPs with the same root box x row is dense in the algebra of real with continuous functions. Okay, so now we can do set interse intersections, uh, symmetric set difference, uh, and so on. So we have some projects looking at like uh, brain shapes from healthy and sick patients and stuff. So you have set, set arithmetic as well. So uh, take samples. Let's go back to the original problem. We have these samples. Now we want to reconstruct f. And, and to do that, remember I told you the data is trickling in. So the data is pouring in here. And you simply keep track of a counter, how many things went through there, like a grocery machine, I mean grocery store. Cha -ching, cha -ching, cha -ching. These are called recursively computable statistics. Fisher had these ideas as well, and lots of others. So as data comes in, these will go increment. And so we know, and then we hold pointers to the actual data itself in the leaf nodes and sort of move them up and down as the tree moves. And I'm just showing the heights. They come from the total number of counts there that fell in there, divided by the total number of points that was pumped in there, which is 10 over 10 times 1 over 1. The, de the denominator is the volume here. So we just divide by, uh, so that's called the, uh, that's the empirical measure. That's, that's your estimate of the histogram. So we kind of have both of these things in memory. So these things are reacting to the data and then we periodically get a snapshot of these things and do things arithmetic with it and, and go and decide how this thing should behave with this. Uh, it's, you know, it's how the Markov chain can, should behave. Okay, so here is uh, the same thing for the Levy density. And if people uh, want, to, want to insist on using kernel density estimation, which is a standard tool in stats, and it's very important, if the underlying density is not too complicated, it's way more efficient. So if, if your assumptions are fine, then you can do your kernel density estimate, which you should, because it has much er better error bounds if f is smooth enough. And then you can approximate it using RMRP very, very quickly, okay, uniformly. And then the approximation time is a fraction of the time it takes with just 2,000 points. It takes quite a bit, but you know these are just the uniform errors for these RMRP approximations, and they're very, very quick compared to the time it took you to make the KDE. Now you have the KDE. For, for speed under smoothness assumptions, and you have RMRP arithmetic going hand in hand. So this is John Lennon, right? So let's imagine there's, there's no schools here. So a uh, pointwise image is straightforward. So a lot of times statisticians just want to ask what's the height of a box uh, for a new point, query point, then you can just check that up. So I mean, I won't go through this. It's, uh, and this is essentially the highest density regions. Okay, so you can find out what regions are highest density, which allows you to do Lebesgue integration now because you can split upstairs and pull the things back downstairs. And Okay, so these are the things I was talking about. We have in implemented the, the integrations as tree arithmetic as well, the marginalization operators and slices. That was Jenny Harlow's work actually. And then these are the slices. Uh, these are also implemented as tree operations. Okay, so Hopefully, um, I won't go through this. This will be of interest to internal analysts, but uh, I don't think I'm going to have any time to do the other part, but I will just point out there's just a lot of stuff here, and it's the most important thing, really. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I think I'm kind of, yeah, basically, you've got some randomized algorithms, and you know, and blah, blah, and then minimum distance estimation is this problem posed by Luke DeVroy using ideas of Yatrakos and Sheffe, the guy who broke his head, his nose broken. He's like a real statistician. So, you know, uh, 
okay, this is a complicated problem because what you need to now do is to actually, if you have just k densities, you have to find out for every pair of densities, what is the set of all x where one density is strictly greater than the other, and the set of all x where the other density is strictly greater than the first one. That's called a Sheffey set. And then a Yatterkos class is all ordered pairs of Sheffey sets. So you have k densities, you have to choose the best one. That's the problem. You've done a lot of hard work to get your algorithm to k. k is now 1,000, or say 100. And then you've justified that asymptotically. Now comes the smoothing problem. How, how sh what should I do? So then, basically, I have to do the k square minus k uh, points of the Ziotrakos matrix and find the Sheffey sets. Once I found the Sheffey sets, then I'm done because I hold out and, and I use the held out empirical measure to control how I should control. Right? Of course, we are limited by the assumption that it's IID, but that's the breaks. Thanks. <laughs>